We're delighted to have you here to talk about skilling the future workforce and the public using AI. And I'm sure that today's event will be full of really interesting insights and nuggets. And I really recommend you go on to the Twitter feed of COGX, which is available at, at COGX2020, and also the feed of our sponsor for this stage, which is the Institute for the Future of Work, which is at underscore future of work. Over the course of this panel, you'll undoubtedly have some really interesting questions. And so I encourage you to put any questions that you have or any ideas that you have on Slido on the Cognition X website. And to introduce our panelists and the session in general, I'm going to hand you over to Rose Luckin, Professor at UCL. Thank you and welcome to this session. I'm really excited about moderating. I've got some great guests here and I do feel that skilling the public and getting everybody ready um, to really leverage AI is hugely important for the future of work. And so today I'm delighted to be joined by Sir Anthony Selden, um, Vice Chancellor of University of Buckingham, by Megan Scheibel, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Reactor Education, and Priya Lakhani, who is the CFO, not the CFO, sorry, the CEO <laughs> and founder of Century Tech. So welcome to this panel. And I'd like to invite each of you to give us a quick few minutes on what you're doing, how your work relates to this really difficult challenge of, re of getting the public and the workforce skilled up and understanding AI and ready to use it. Priya, can I start with you, please? Yes, yeah, sure. So I'm the founder and chief executive of Century Tech. So we have a platform that goes directly into schools where um, students are using AI for their learning. And so what thing about that generation is that when they're actually using technology um, for for learning, what they do every day at school, and that technology is using AI, explaining to them why it's coming up with personalised recommendations. It's interesting because that generation then it becomes second nature to them. You know, they grew up using that technology. We train teachers. Yeah teachers around the country and um, CPD continuing professional development on AI how the technology is different because obviously many people think well one technology is the other but AI is very different it's far more complex it's intelligent and so that's what we're doing in, in the education sector itself which is obviously a huge sector it's really important to educate the education sector about what AI is and what it can do and then uh, in another role, um, which is, uh, it's a voluntary role, but I'm on the UK government's AI council. And on the council, we are looking at AI as a whole, how to ensure that the UK as a whole um, stays in its position as number three in the world in AI. But also as part of that, it's about how to educate our stakeholders, our citizens about AI, how we can you know, increase digital skills and AI skills in the economy to ensure that we can keep that competitive position, particularly in the post-Brexit world where it'll be really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And Megan, now coming to you, because Finland is really you know, moving ahead with this. I love that the, the approach of the 1% project, and uh, I'd really like to know more about what you're doing and the elements of AI. So can you tell us a little bit about your role and, and what you're doing in this space? Yes, so uh, I'm actually, Reactor Education is a new division within Reactor. So uh, Reactor itself is an international technology consultancy. We have about 600 employees around the world. And this was really a project that we did um, with the University of Helsinki that started off to us as, as just wanting to create something to help educate the general population on AI. And it really turned into more of a sort of cultural phenomenon as well as an, as an online course. So what Elements of AI is, uh, is a free online course uh, that was specifically designed for people who are typically left out of technology discussions. And then we also sort of built this goal into it. So not just having the course and putting it online, but having this challenge built around it, as you've mentioned, uh, which was to educate 1% of the Finnish population on the basics of AI. And so what really happened with, with uh, our team being on board, we're not educators and we were not in this space. What we do is we understand how people interact with technology and we understand how to build really um, well-functioning technology products for people in a way that functions for them. So using design thinking and tools like that. And that's how we approach this project. So with elements of AI, if you go and look at it, the look and feel, the graphics, the UI, the kind of language that we're using is really uh, really aimed at that, at that demographic. And we've seen 
really great things come out of that. So right now we're almost at, I think, 440,000 students around the world. We've reached over 3% of the Finnish population. We have students now in almost every country um, on earth. Uh, we're also taking the course uh, along with partners in the European Union, the European um, uh, Commission, that was a gift uh, from the Finnish Office of the Presidency of the European Council to bring elements of AI across Europe. So we're, we've uh, had it translated into uh, every single official European language. And my team is now working with local governments and universities in order to get this in front of the general population and people on the ground. So that's where I, re where I really say it's a combination of that sort of cultural phenomenon where we had these sort of grassroots movements coming out of the course, but then also trying to think about the course design itself. How do you take a subject that is as abstract and intimidating as AI and actually turn it into something that is really approachable and engaging to, to just the average uh, person? So those are the two things that we brought together. I certainly love the course. I uh, We've been doing uh, a set of webinars for our, our stakeholders around AI readiness. And in the first webinar, I always recommend that everybody has a look at elements of AI because I think it's very accessible and interesting and nicely designed. And I'm really pleased to hear that you've got to 3% of the Finnish population. I think that's brilliant. Anthony, over to you. I mean, you're a, a world leading educator and you're passionate about AI. Um, what are your feelings about this business of preparing the public, the workforce, and how does that relate to all the great stuff that you're doing at Buckingham? Uh, well, thank you, Rose, very much, and very nice to, to uh, be with all of you. And if AI was responsible for my food now, it wouldn't be <laughs> flashing yeah. away in this ridiculous uh, third three-point way that it is. So, very briefly, um, I have run uh, two secondary schools in Britain, in fact, all age schools called Brighton College and Wellington College. I'm now running um, a university uh, at Buckingham uh, with its medical school. And I'm the only person currently who in the country who has run both schools and uh, uh, a university. So my interest is in education all the way from three mm. up to uh well 92 is our oldest student at the moment um i'd like to go all the way up to a hundred uh, and beyond so i'm really interested in what education is uh rose and everybody uh and how we can do it better and how we can prepare people better for the world of work and how AI is going to impact on that. Now, AI is going to have two very clear and very distinct impacts on education. First, on the way that we educate yeah. our young people at primary, secondary, further and higher education, which it will completely transform more than any change since the printing press. And secondly, on the world that we're going to be preparing people for, which is not just the world of work, but also the society in which they're going to be operating, where healthcare, the way that uh, we think about looking after our physical and mental health will change completely, as well as the job preparing people four um, and as Priya said Britain might be third but Britain's in danger of slipping down but it could actually go upwards if there was a far more of a grip uh, on uh, what uh, AI is by government and by um, uh, uh, by the corporate sector and the financial sector in this country, there's a great opportunity uh, to really be a world leader with our liberal, and our humane values, open values in this country, we have very much to offer. Let me finish there. That's really interesting to hear you say that. I mean, I think it is a very important issue. And I worry about the fact that people making decisions don't really, making very important decisions, don't really understand enough about AI themselves. And you work a lot with the government in the UK, Anthony. What's your recommendation to them to try and help us get this going faster here i mean i think it's brilliant that finland have got three percent of the the general public educated in ai using their approach what would you say to our ministers and policymakers about what we need to do here to move forward at the sort of pace we really need to be moving forward so uh rose 
for the last 30 years, I've written the inside and very detailed books about number 10 and prime ministers. And I would have to say in all honesty that it's very rare for a prime minister or uh, a cabinet minister to really understand what AI is because it hasn't been their world in which they've been uh, brought up. And so uh, we have to encourage them and make it uh, clear and simple and show how there are clear social um, and uh, technological and uh, economic benefits from the country from really getting right ahead on AI. I would actually slightly challenge the, the notion that AI is complex to understand. I think mm. you can certainly uh, put AI across in a very complex way. But, you know, most people uh, understand how um, uh, their, the, the, their machines in their cars guide them in real time, how that differs to a two-dimensional map, which is uh, uh, 3.0. Um, and so I think that we can overcomplicate matters. And at my own university, Rose, we are starting next year um, the world's, uh, we believe, the world's first uh, AI uh, facilitated degree, not about AI, but using the whole range of 4.0 technologies, including AR, VR, MR, to really educate um, our students on our two year degrees that we offer at Buckingham in a much profounder way. And in medical education, also with our training, our, our educating our doctors, again, AI is so invaluable to the way that. Um, we are preparing young people. In short, Rose, we are preparing uh, young people pretty well in our uh, schools and colleges and universities. We're educating them pretty well for the 20th century. <laughs> yes, 20th absolutely. Century technology to educate them for the last century. Not bad, Britain. Thank you. And so, so, Megan, over to you. What what have been the challenges with your approach? And as I say, I've, I've been through your Elements of AI course several times because I wanted to recommend it to people, so I wanted to know exactly what was there. You know, what have been the challenges in engaging people? As Anthony says, that, you know, there can be the impression that this is complex, but actually, when it's explained clearly, as it is in your course, it's not so hard. So what's, what have been the challenges and what have been your successes with the, with the people that you've been designing for? I think that the challenge has been what the success is. And that is to say that uh, the education itself, if you, if you approach it in a traditional manner, then it's probably going to turn out in the same way that it has before. So a lot of the courses online right now are these kind of um, video MOOCs. Their MOOCs are the yeah. massive open yeah. online courses. And they are uh, essentially copy paste to the lecture theater environment. So you have people standing in front of a whiteboard or in front of slide decks, and they're going through uh, courses that take people as long as a whole semester to complete. Um, and, and it's really, you know, a lot of downloadable things, a lot of workbooks, and it's not really um, intuitive in, in terms of the way that people are living in their modern lives and learning. So if you can imagine a target demographic for us, the people that we're trying to approach who are maybe, you know, um, middle-aged, working full-time, they have children, they have jobs, they have all these things going on. How do you actually create something that, that, that is going to be educating or providing information for them in the way they need it uh, and where they need it and when they need it? So if people are learning on the go in their free time, how do you actually deconstruct these things into, into bite-sized and easily digestible amounts. And then the copy editing and the, and the uh, graphics on it as well are something that is really crucial because it can create something that makes it feel inviting rather than threatening. So this is the entire premise of the course is that we wanted people to feel empowered by AI rather than threatened by it. And we've, you yeah. know, uh, the idea is if, if, if AI is like electricity and it's going to impact all of our lives in ways that we're only now imagining, how do we actually, uh, how do we actually do that? How do we get it out of the hands of elite coders and into the hands of the people who are actually being impacted by it every day? And, uh, you know, to some of your, your, your points earlier about, um, you know, it's a multi-layered issue to get this into all levels of society. It's really important to get this into schools, but it's also important to get it into the hands of our politicians. We've given uh, several talks at the at the EU on this course and, and how it can be used. And hopefully now with this project, we can get it in front of more people. But the idea as well is anyone can create something and put it online. But how do you 
how do you strike a message and a tone and start to create a movement on the ground where that people can share it word of mouth? I think there's yeah. a lot of great online education out there. It's just not getting in front of people. And so that's why, you know, as victims of our own sort of success in this, we've taken this approach it, with the EU project and the rollout to actually make those contacts with local governments, with people on the ground to say, how would this work best for your uh, local population? So just that, that sort of, um, uh, uh, combination of things is really, really how to make it work. And the University of Helsinki has been with us uh, every step of the way on this. So we've had this academic partner providing this foundation for us as well, uh, because we, like I said, are not educators. So it's really been this kind of public private partnership that turned yeah. into this thing that really people haven't seen before. And we're still trying to navigate as we go. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, we, we've got this uh, sequel course called building AI that's going to be coming out in the autumn trying again to lower the barriers to entry yeah. for people to be able to actually start coding and, and and building machine learning models. And again, we approach that project in the same way. If you've never coded before, what would that course look like for you? And what would it look like if you knew a little bit of coding, but you maybe didn't know Python? So that's the kind of things that we're thinking about. And the course will have all of those elements contained in it at different levels. Brilliant. I love it. I should look out for that one. Uh, Priya, you, you're, you are you know, in charge of a, a, a company that's built a really lovely platform. And I know that you say often that it's used in other countries of the world to a greater extent than it is in the UK. Is that a worry, do you think, for the way that we might be going in terms of getting people skilled and ready and accepting of AI? Yeah, sure. I mean, the UK, uh, COVID has changed things. Obviously, we've uh, it's catalyzed the adoption of technology um, and, you know, it's numbers are skyrocketing um, every single day, even as we get closer to thinking that lockdown might be lifted in, in certain ways in terms of schools. We've got year six and year ones going in now. And um, there are still schools on boarding now because they're now aware of technology. Right. So um, it, although it's such a devastating time, you know, no one talk about COVID really in a positive light. But at the same time, um, what I have seen is that actually UK adoption has um, has risen. And so, so that's in, in a sense there is some positivity there but you're right internationally you know we will onboard more schools in four days in the middle east um, and the far east for yeah. them four years in the uk um and that is a problem it's a, it's a problem for the uk um simply because th there are certain challenges that we have to deal with here in education there is the infrastructure problem that actually many countries have it's not uh, in fact some countries have worse a problem than we do um, we need to sort out the infrastructure we need to make sure that coastal towns rural towns children have enough devices, they have enough bandwidth. You know, we used to talk about 4G, now we're talking about 5G, fiber, etc. We need to make sure they, they can access this technology in the first place. The second is the mindset issue. There are teachers mm. out there, educators, who think that if you put an AI in school, it's somehow going to replace a teacher, which is, yeah. is not true, it's nonsense, it can't ever happen. You know, a, 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 an AI is not gonna turn itself on in the classroom and start walking around and talking to the kids. Um, it doesn't do that. It's technology at the moment. It's narrow AI. It's able to augment the teaching role for teaching and learning. And actually, I, we like to think of it, and this is not my quote, so I won't take credit for it, but one of our um, deputy head teachers said, it's the sidekick to the superhero, you know, the superhero being the teacher. And it empowers them, which is a really lovely phrase um, that I've borrowed from him. And uh, and it can augment teaching. So it's about the mindset challenge. In other parts of the world, what we've seen is they've been so keen to implement AI technology and buy it in from elsewhere. See, some countries are very much into the race, you know, who's going to win the race of building their own AI? There are other countries out there that are very clear that they're not necessarily going to win that race. So how yeah. can you therefore adopt AI that's already been built elsewhere, adopt it well, focus on the embedding of that technology. These are usually slightly smaller countries because they just don't have the data scientists and the data engineers to build the technology from scratch. But they want to be the most innovative country. They want to actually be more efficient. They want to work smarter rather than harder. They want to improve their education system so much that they are willing to put technology in statewide into all schools and measure the impact. They don't want to wait for 10 countries to do it first because they already see the benefits of AI in every other sector in the world. And so they've adopted it statewide. So for example, we have the federal contract for the United Arab Emirates that were the first was the first country to take AI. Now this is like a year ago. So there have been other statewide systems since then that have procured our system. Um, and what we're seeing therefore in the UK is that if we follow the Rogers adoption curve, and I think that adoption curve has shifted, you know, yeah. pre-COVID, 
um, I would say we were pretty much in sort of the, the, the innovators and the pioneers have been using our technology for the last few years. We're in the sort of early adopter stage. COVID has pushed us into the early majority. The early majority are now using the technology because they were forced to go online. You've still got the late majority and, and what I politely, it's not me, but call them the laggards who come kicking and screaming, um, who, were, who were just using sort of Microsoft Teams and Zoom and essentially digitizing exactly what they do manually in the classroom and yeah. find lockdown really, really difficult, right? So that's the adoption curve. And I think that in the UK, you know, even if it's been accelerated because of COVID, you still, it will take time for the rest of the schools to adopt technology. I do believe in five years, they'll all be using AI personalized technology to augment teaching and learning. But in other countries, what they've done is they've just skipped that. They've just bought it for the state or they've been able to embed it so effectively in a few schools and then it's sort of trickled there's been a domino effect and other schools have taken it on that has huge implications right because AI has been proven to increase outcomes it's more about personalized education it's proven to save teachers time so we're starting to now advance an education system that's actually that, that's not ours in the UK and we have to be conscious of that because if outcomes and literacy levels and numeracy levels are increasing if personalized ed education is available elsewhere then what does that mean here and the final point i'd make on that is that as you know i said before and anthony sort of reiterated about the importance about being a world leader you know the best way to teach our children about ai is for them to use it because yeah. then it becomes very natural for them and actually if there are many children particularly the disadvantaged children who miss out then you can see it's going to exacerbate in a sense the attainment gap it can exacerbate differences in terms of knowledge, you know, in a tertiary economy, like what does that mean? And so that's why I think it's incredibly important that, um, that that we look very, very seriously as to, you know, what hardware do our children have? What access to infrastructure and bandwidth do they have? And how can we educate the education sector about what AI is and why it's different? Because then they can make a really informed decision about how they could then leverage that technology themselves as an educator yeah. to improve teaching and learning. And do you think there's anything that government and policymakers should be doing to try and um, accelerate that? Process? Yeah, well, I'm going to say this um, uh, as an independent perspective. I'm not speaking for any um, government advisory board that I'm on. Um, I think, and I've I've called for it before when I wrote a piece at City AM, I, I think I, I like the idea the UAE, UAE has a, um, an AI minister. I think it's yeah. really important. And I think digital is a big space now. Digital is huge. We can't, you know, one minister in yeah. charge of digital is just, um, that's a huge job. The Department of Culture, Media and Sport has to look after the theatres, the opera houses and digital infrastructure. I mean, it's just, just really huge. So I think an AI minister, um, somebody who's got that industry expertise would be really great. You don't actually need to understand how to build a neural network or mark up yeah. sequencing models, um, you know, which I've done now for a couple of years, you know, pre-building century. And and, and, and you don't you need to understand the application of AI. And so being able to understand how it's applied is really important and sort of how it works on a very basic sense. As Anthony said, he's absolutely right. This is not that complex. It's about making it simple. So somebody in government who can do that, I think we need to um government's job has generally always been, and, and this is again my view, but it's to pave the way for industry to do well. They have to build an infrastructure so that everyone else can thrive. I don't think there are parts of government that genuinely want to interfere in our lives in, in the I know people might go mad at me on social media about that, but but I, I've not met ministers who genuinely Really want to do that but they do want to create an infrastructure but in order to create the infrastructure yeah. you need to understand what infrastructure you need and you need to ensure your infrastructure is as future proof as you can make it right and so I think there's a lot of work to be done there's a lot that we can do there's a lot that industry will do anyway and I think the biggest challenge for, for government at the moment and they're realizing this is that you know they can either stay ahead of the curve and pave the way or they're just going to be looking at AI and industry race ahead yeah. and oh god how do we regulate this because that's that's what's going to happen that's how revolution and change happens so it's up to them really and industry yeah. is is happy to help and happy to advise and happy to happy to show them you know the products and services and how they work and i'm sure and there are many ministers by the way out there who who are very interested i know matt hancock particularly is a is very tech savvy um and i know that you know i, I in no way am i trying to uh, trying to criticize but I do think there's a lot of room for improvement yeah thank you Priya Anthony I'd like to come back to you what do you think you're um, running courses at your university that are 4.0 as you describe them using emerging technologies including AI what are the biggest challenges that you find as a leader 
of a large institution, getting everybody on board, getting them to to, to see the benefits. So um, we're also trying to get uh, Britain's first four point naught school that will be a free school, which will be a, a state school, which is at the very cutting edge of the adoption of these new four point naught technologies that go way beyond um, AI. So um, the benefit of having all that in one university on a undergraduate yeah. and postgraduate program is is clear. But you know it is challenging because. Um, uh, we are all students, uh, staff, uh, parents, uh, teachers are, are all academics. You know, we're all naturally um, conservative. We're all naturally suspicious of change. There's always the issue about yeah. how can we experiment um, on students and treat them as, as guinea pigs. So uh, these are just some of the, the, the difficulties which you asked me to talk about. And how do you persuade people of the benefits, Anthony? <laughs> uh, uh, with optimism and uh, with uh, uh, encouragement. And, and as we've all been saying, uh, the students who've grown up uh, with uh, this as naturally a part of their technology, um, and life and don't see it as difficult. Indeed, AI is simpler than non-AI in, in many ways. They don't see it as uh, a threatening or, or, or frightening uh, or alien. Uh, what we've set up the Institute for the Ethics of AI in, in Education, uh, as you know, to try to get ahead of the ethical yeah. issue on 4.0 in the way that we did on 3.0. Uh, if we can do that, then it's it's wins for everybody. Uh, teachers will be able to concentrate more at, at both university and at school on teaching, less burdened by bureaucracy. Students will be able to have far more personalised learning and a far broader learning, uh, including the arts and uh, uh, and music. Uh, take singing. If you're learning singing, it's it can be much better and less embarrassing to be learning uh, using uh, the technology rather than having a singing teacher, which can't isn't affordable in many uh, schools around the world or state schools uh, in Britain. It prepares you much better for the world uh, of work with flexible, adaptive learning. I mean, what is the point uh, in having our entire school system focused on arid, dull, dead GCSEs and A-levels uh, without giving our young people the skills. I mean, there's important content in that, but we need to be giving much more yeah. to help people, not least, Rose, with the mental health skills. That AI is also very good at developing that sense of who we are. The education system uh, currently, and there have been many people listening to this who uh, have children at schools, uh, the education system isn't interested, is not interested uh, fundamentally in what the individual child thinks or feels. It's interested in them, this is the world over, and them giving the right answer, or what they consider the right yeah. answer, in the right way at the right time. Uh, AI allows for individuation and differentiation. It, in, it celebrates the creative response, the original response rather than uh, the right response, because it has the space and the aptitude in the same way that uh, Priya is talking about alongside uh, the helper, al alongside the, 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 the superhero, um, facilitating uh, and uh, uh, making that possible. Brilliant. Thank you, Anthony. I'd like to come back to Megan now, because one of the things that I think comes out of a lot of these discussions is concerns about diversity. Um, and one of the things that is hugely beneficial, as you've been saying about AI, is its ability to adapt to different people's needs and therefore hopefully meet the needs of a diverse population. But actually, 
we don't have a diverse population currently working in AI. We do to an extent in terms of age and location and 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 gender, the, the way that people would volunteer that information to us. And from what we found, over 40% of our course takers globally are women. And they're over actually 50% in Nordic countries where we have most of our where we have most of our course takers. And if you look at that demographic, then that's over two and a half times every other computer science course online on average. Yeah. Um, but really, I think that a lot of this is with with the diversity in AI. You do, if you don't have people that are actually um, representing different different aspects of diversity in the room when you're building AI, then the AI outcome is actually going to be it, it's possible that it's even more biased than it was before. And if people understand yeah. how these kind of data flows work, you know, you have garbage in, garbage out. And if you if you understand um, really what it takes to 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 build machine learning models, what is this black box that people talk about? How does it actually work? How can we break it down? I think to Priya's point earlier um, about needing that kind of infrastructure at a governmental level is so important because what's happening right now with um, with the problems that are arising because of the lack of diversity in AI. There's great papers out there like um, you know UNESCO's uh, I blush if I could which is basically only studying just the one problem of uh, uh, voice assistance online. Just taking one aspect of how people interact with AI and, and, and really breaking it apart and saying things like, you know, um, if you ask uh, uh, Google Assist a question in a, in a female voice, you'll actually get a different answer than if you would ask the yeah. same question in a man's voice. You know, so all of these things are kind of coming out and people are accessing them and they have the internet and they have their news feeds and they're getting bombarded with all of this information and misinformation and fear mongering. And I think that that's really at the crux in the governmental level, but also in the general population, trying to break down these things. They are simple enough to break down if you use real life examples. But the lack of infrastructure itself, on the one hand, governments don't want to overregulate because they don't want to stymie their own co governments or environments to have that kind of research, research or, or the latest um, you know, types of technology. But on the other hand, a total lack of it, a total lack of infrastructure and, and, and understanding on a government level of what's going on creates a sort of wild west. In AI, yeah, and you're seeing that in, in terms of recruitment algorithms that people are using. You know, having people's faces be recorded on video um, in in a in a recruitment uh, uh, software that no per no human being ever interacts with, and they say you know that it's based on the successful people that are inside the company. So they'll assess the, they'll they'll do video recordings and interviews of those people, and they'll use those people as representative of what will be a successful candidate, and that's what they look for in things like sentiment you know sentiment analysis. Yeah. They use NLP, natural language processing, to understand people's vocabularies. And then in the Washington Post, they will write an article saying computers are biased, people aren't biased. We're going to, you know, we're, we're not making these recruitment processes more biased. And the average person will read something like that and not really know what to believe. So how do yes. you, you know, how do you provide this structure from a kind of, you know, bottom up level with the kind of education, providing these real life examples, trying uh, in as many ways as possible to get information out to people using the tools they're already using. And then also that bottom down approach of having somebody keeping keeping a lookout for these things that, that people feel that they can trust. Yeah, I think that's really important. It's really refreshing to hear you say that when I studied computer science and AI a few years ago, I was one of only two female students on the course. And then when I taught it, uh, I never had more than two female students on the course. And it's great to hear that, that, that the numbers are increasing. Um, and we certainly did a huge amount to try and bring more women in. Um, so I think that's one part, but obviously we need diversity beyond um, gender, which is really important. Priya, when you're going out into schools, do you notice any difference in the 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 sorts of teachers that yeah. infuse about century and, and pick up on century. Do you notice anything about how diverse or not those those teachers yeah. are as a group? So we have a lot of data on this actually. We collect um, data. We also survey them, right? So we survey um, teachers in schools, you know, what other technology they use, what do they want, what do they know about it, and we have a really good sense. So the answer is um, it's actually very diverse in terms of gender um sort of ethnicity um it, th there's not an issue there but where there is a huge obvious um issue and disparity is where you have um teachers from and i'm going to say this in a polite way as i can say it uh, well-run organized schools 
to teachers in schools that are really frazzled because they have challenges that that seem really insurmountable yeah they are struggling so and in those schools um, I classify most of those when I see them and when my team sees them because we work with thousands of schools and um, they're schools where they have big huge churn of teachers so lots and lots of teachers sort of turning you know leaving new ones joining uh, leadership churn um, senior management so head teacher maybe two or three head teachers and the last two or three years um those schools are really really difficult so in those schools they have very little bandwidth and very little time mm. to think about um technology what else they might want to do to enhance teaching and learning you will often find and there are that you know this is not just me there is evidence to, to to back this up that those schools tend to be in poorer areas you know where you're looking at demographics mm. uh, you really want to level the playing field, right? You really want to decrease the attainment gap. And actually during COVID, what you found, and there are definitely exceptions everywhere, right? There are there are teachers from all over the place that have done, I mean, they're all trying to do really well. They're all doing exceptional jobs. I think we should clap for them weekly, uh, yearly, whatever we, we need to do to show them our appreciation looking after their own children as well as ours um, online. But um, but I think there are teachers all over the place that are making an effort. But what you will also see is a huge gap between teachers that were very tech savvy when COVID happened, even if they hadn't been online before at school, they figured it out, they figured out a few resources to use compared to the ones that didn't. Again, you will see that same difference. So yeah. I think economic disadvantage is where you will see um, a gap, not some of the other uh, other other areas where we you know we traditionally look at diversity and for example at century just building an education company we're 50 percent female 50 percent male and we didn't hire for i hire the best people for the job and um, simply just do I, I make no apologies for that whatsoever and and we happen to have um a very very good um you know it's, it's very diverse but in, in education you know one thing that is just a systemic problem is you, you tend to have less females as, as heads as head teachers so they're also suspicious i mean anthony's going to be yeah. our best speaking for that than I am but um when it comes to purchasing technology or understanding technology it really is about disadvantage and it's the fact it's time you know it's, it's not about having the technology now that is AI technology exists right where we speak to them we have articles in the chairs in the BBC on the BBC everywhere it's about change management and it's about yeah. mind and it's the fact that when they have parents that have one device at home and three children right what do you want the teacher to do? The teacher is going to say, as much as I love this, I cannot use this technology at home because most of my kids don't have access to devices. And at school, when you go into some ICT suites, you know, you see I IMAX everywhere in some schools. In others, you go in and you say, I recognize that computer from about 10 years ago. And when, you know, you switch it on, it's slow, it's running old software. Yeah. Need, technology companies, we don't build our technology for, um, you know, windows seven or whatever else it is we don't do that so so we have to get over a lot more issues but at the same time i'm really optimistic i'm incredibly optimistic about and um, what we have to offer about what teachers are trying to achieve for children now that they've been forced to go online and um, and i think that you know this new normal is going to be really really interesting we just have to make sure that those from the disadvantaged backgrounds have the time to, to you know all the help they're, they're helped and they, they're able to understand what resources are available to help actually help them work smarter rather than harder as I say and save time. Yeah no that's interesting now we're saving the questions for the Q&A session but because one of them is very specific about um, your technology prayer I'm going to ask it because you talked about economics and uh, I'll read you the question as it is. Uh, my free school is waiting for approval um, but needs an AI like the one Priya has built are these expensive? Well, first of all, congratulations on the free school because <laughs> that's an amazing achievement. I know how difficult it is to get that application through. Um, so AI is, as you know, a true AI. I know that 40% of companies, the FT said, use the word AI as a marketing term. So we have to be careful about what is what is real AI and, and what isn't. Um, and AI like Century is obviously very expensive to, um, to build. It is the premium product out there. It's not the free one that goes out and says, on Twitter, can everyone just build some content for us and throw it on our platform because it's got to be pedagogically sound content. Um, you know, and I know that uh, Megan was explaining before how they built their course and they've been in the green room. We were talking about how she, you know, they've used design thinking and, and they've done, you know, they've sort of painstakingly built this course for the stakeholders, which is amazing. We do that for all of our, our topics and the system, obviously the technology itself takes years to build. It's expensive. But in terms of the actual products and service, I mean, during COVID, it's free, obviously, before, um, uh, you know, before schools open again fully. But when uh, your school is opened, it's not. So uh, because it's a social enterprise, 
And it's very much based on the model of we want it to be, we don't want it to be cost primitive. Actually, I can only speak for Century. I can't speak for other products. But for example, you know, a primary school might pay one and a half thousand pounds for the year for all students, all, all parents, all guardians. A secondary school pay about five thousand pounds a year for the whole thing. And and it's a beast of a system. So we've never had from our data feedback that this is too expensive, that yeah. we don't want to pay for it. I've never had that from all of our feedback and, and our conversion rates are actually really high because schools tend to, we don't tend to go out to schools and cold call them. We don't do that. Schools speak to each other. That's why growth in a sense, potentially my fault, but has been slightly slower in the UK than elsewhere in the world because we rely on schools. Just Teachers listen to teachers, right? Um, yeah. But in September, you know, We've, we've, it's still grown astronomically so no it's not expensive and, and just you know we could I think the most important thing for this college is the software is not expensive it's just not but you what you need to do is you need to think about the triangle you need to think about the software you need to have the hardware and you need to have the infrastructure you need to have the bandwidth if you have those three things you can create a beautiful environment where you could use blended learning flip learning there are all these strategies where you can use technology and it just doesn't replace the teacher it's augmentative it helps with teaching and learning but you have to think about all three there are schools yeah. out there that want a new shiny thing right they want a new shiny thing they'll go and buy 2,000 new ipads or tablets or whatever but then they haven't got strong enough bandwidth and they haven't got great software so think about it in a triangle you need to cost and budget it all up uh, and then you need to think about how you're going to embed it and how you're going to bring your teachers on the journey with you. you don't don't ever enforce something top down and just say you're doing this. Um, you know, no one likes that. You've got to show it to the teachers, let them take ownership, be pioneers of using this technology. And then you'll see amazing usage, amazing usage throughout. Brilliant. Thanks, Priya. Now, we've only got a few minutes left. So I want to come over to Anthony and then Megan um, to, to have a final word, too. What if you could give a message to any of the people listening today about what you believe needs to be done in order to ensure that we do skill up the population, both the general public, people in the workplace at the moment, and people in schools and colleges. What, what's the most important thing that we can do? Anthony, asking you that first. Adopt it ourselves and understand it ourselves and educate people around us. Just shouting out about it uh, doesn't help. It's when we use these in our own workplaces, in our own homes, in the education of our own uh, children that we can recognise that they are extraordinarily mm. enriching and important uh, and that the fears uh, uh, hardly transpire, though we need to be conscious of the risks at all time. But um, it's coming. You know, the, the printing press, a lot of people didn't like uh, the printing press, thought it would destroy the church. It didn't, thought it would destroy learning. Uh, it actually uh, made learning enormously um, richer. It in enhanced uh, social mobility and it, it uh, economic growth and all that will happen with AI. So the choice is uh, for people listening, they presumably because you're listening, you're interested in it anyway, you're either on the bus um, or you're going to be following behind the bus. Uh, and, and that's the choice that, that we make. It, it's a wonderfully uh, humanizing, enriching, uh, most important opportunity that comes around every 500 years. And COVID has accelerated uh, the, the, the uh, adoption rate by five to 10 years. And Britain either has the chance to be a world leader or a world follower. And I don't know what that's going to be, but I hope it's a leader. Thank you, Anthony. Megan, over to you. What would be your final obviously sign up um, yes. for elements yes, uh, elementsofai.com yes um, but i would say uh, you know thinking not just about the education itself and the way that you're designing it and delivering it uh, but also for us we've discovered this kind of grassroots movement around it so how can you do that in your own communities and in your own places and companies um, the best way that we've found to explain things to people that are abstract is to talk about what they already know, what they're already using. Yeah. So if you're going to talk about search algorithms, open up Google Maps. If you're going to talk about, you know, um, algorithmic bias or, you know, how these kind of things can work for good or bad, open up the Facebook news feed. You know, start to open conversations with people in a way that is, you're already using this every single day. 
So if that's the case, then, then people can feel a lot more agency around this. And then as Priya mentioned uh, earlier, again, having that kind of infrastructure, having things that people can look to, knowing where these resources are. That's what we did with the, the, the grassroots movement that we found is, you know, you can build anything and it can be brilliant, but you have to find a way to get it in front of the, the people that yeah. actually need it, which are the people who don't go necessarily looking for this in the first place. So could, can this be built into the apps that we use where it's explaining what these things are? Um, yeah, and, and just, I, I can see that we're, we're wrapping up the time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Megan. That, thank you to all my guests. That was a brilliant discussion. Um, We've had somebody who's an educational leader, somebody who's developing AI to help everybody understand it better, and somebody who is out there having built an AI platform for education. So it's been a very rich discussion. Thank you all for taking part, and thank you to everybody who's been listening. In 15 minutes, we'll have a question and answer session, and we'll certainly pick up the questions that have come through and any others that are posed at that time. Thank you very much for joining us today, and goodbye. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.